Hi, this is David Olavsky, and welcome to the Rabbi Olavsky Show. Whether you're watching with our good friends over at Torah Anytime, and by the way, I would like to thank everybody from the Rabbi Olavsky uh, audience who uh, donated to their cause and uh, to Torah Anytime to help them uh, get going and continue their wonderful work. Um, and, uh, you know, I would every now and then go and check on my page and see who is there. So I really want to thank each one of you personally. And I, I Hashem, I will, but uh, collectively, let me thank everybody who participated uh, in their program. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if that applies to wherever you are uh, watching or listening to your podcast. Uh, we have a sponsor for this week, once again, by our good friend, the Freeds. And this is sponsored by Robertson Mindy Fried. For Yud Sivan, Le'ilay Nishmas, my father, Yitzchak Yaakov Grunberg, Oliver Shalom, thank you. Uh, a very exceptional person. I had this chus of knowing him. He davened in my father-in-law's shul. And uh, really... Uh, Tremendous! Everything we do here should be a schus, and uh, for for him and for the family and all of the extended freed uh, uh, clan throughout uh, the world where they are. Okay, I remember the nineteen eighties. Almost every wedding hall, <laughs> almost every restaurant you went to, was pink and silver. I don't know if you still remember this. You know, you could see who has not, uh, who hasn't renovated since the 1980s. You know, it's like everybody had those colors. When I came to Israel in the 1970s, there was this sort of burnt orange look that everything had. All of the curtains in every uh, bank, every office, wherever you went to, it was the same burnt orange. Uh, my uh, my cousin uh, Harriet Hamudot, Oliver Shalom, she told me that when they made Aliyah, uh, there was one textile firm in Israel at the time, <laughs> and um, and uh, she says you would go out and buy yourself a dress, and then you'd pass a man in the street, and his tie was the same as your dress. And then you would sit down at a cafe and the tablecloth was the same as your dress. And you'd walk into a, a bank and the curtains were the same as your dress, you know. So uh, uh, th there are these certain things, you know, nostalgia. Or as somebody once observed, nostalgia is not what it used to be. <laughs> I used to remember when I would land in Israel yeah, for years. I fly LL. As soon as they land, they would start playing. And people on the plane would start singing, you know. It uh I don't do that today. <laughs> people people today they have different expressions that that I always used to find uh a little disturbing. I used to fly like American Airlines a lot, you know. They had this expression that said We'll have you down on the ground in just a couple of minutes. And I'm like, whoa, take your time. <laughs> Hold on to the doors and the wings, you know what I mean? <laughs> on the LL, they would say, we have begun our final descent. <laughs> like, well, this is it. <laughs> I have this type of, one day I'll do it, I'm sure, because it's just been rattling around in my brain. But, you know, when, when we land, I, I want to scream out before anybody else. I'd like to be the first to welcome you to Tel Aviv. <laughs> Why is it always a stewardess who gets to say that? I'd like to be the first to welcome you. No, I'd like to be the first to welcome you. <laughs> anyway, but uh, there, there are certain things that are trends. And uh, you've seen this, you know. There are certain styles. Uh, there was a takufa, maybe it was in the 90s. Uh, women had these outfits with these gigantic shoulder pads, made them look, all look like linebackers, you know. That was, the, that was the style, you know. 
um, there's uh, there's certain styles, and some of them last a very long time. They stick with us, right? Uh, buttons on a gentleman's jacket was introduced by Napoleon Bonaparte because, you know, he had a citizen army and they were not uh, aristocrats as they were in other armies. And uh, so he spent all this money getting them nice uniforms and they would wipe their nose on their sleeve. So he put big buttons on the sleeve so they <laughs> couldn't rub it on. You know, a gentleman uh, often will leave the bottom button of their jacket unbuttoned uh, because um, uh, the uh, one of the King Edwards was too stout to button his jacket. So he used to leave the bottom button open. And everyone's like, well, the king leaves it open. So, of course, I will too, you know. And uh, it stuck with us. So some trends last for a very long time. And some come and go, you know. Um, uh, we've all we've all lived through. Either no matter how old you are, you you've all lived through. Uh, at one point, uh, my kids had these slap bracelets, which were basically this like piece of metal that you would slap it on your wrist and it would snap around. It was pretty dangerous. <laughs> People were hurting themselves. <laughs> but at the time, uh, it's not that long ago that everybody had a fidget spinner. You don't see it today. Yeah, trends, trends come and go. And the same thing is true uh, by almost every aspect in our lives. Um, now you sit down to a Suda, everybody puts out a whole bunch of salads and dips. When I was growing up, you never did that. You know, you know whoever saw such a thing, you, know, you put out the challah, maybe you put out some coleslaw, maybe potato salad. Maybe there was a, a a salad. Understand when I say a salad, I mean a salad. There was vegetables in it. There was no fruit. There were no nuts. There was no there was no candied pecans. There was uh, there was no uh, crackers. You know, it was a salad. Lettuce, tomato, and cucumber. <laughs> that was a salad. Some people would add green pepper. You know, if it was really fancy, they put in radishes and scallions. You know what I mean? Some people would add celery, but that was it. Vegetables. That was a salad, a green salad. You know, today they call it a green salad. You used to call it a salad. That was a default salad, you know. All these different types of salads and dips, uh, that never that never came about. That was a, that was a new innovation that you go any place to a Shabbos Suda today and you have all these dips and salads. You know? I, I want to... Be careful. Make a caveat. I, th I think by the Sephardim, they always did it that way because the Gemara, in fact, describes that everything was eaten with bread. So everything was served. Every dish was served sort of like in a little bowl and you scooped it up with the bread. Um, if you go to an Asian restaurant and you order a mugu gai pan, we say a Chinese restaurant, but I don't think you can say that anymore. So you go to an Asian restaurant, mugu gai pan, they used to give you these little like uh, pancakes and you would like wrap the filling inside of it, you know, and, and uh, eat it like that. That's how they ate everything. They used to give you these big pieces of like pita and everything was dipped. You know, that was, that was how it goes. So I think by Sephardim, they, they never really lost that. Um, I think uh, in Israel, you know, the hummus and tchina thing, uh, people didn't really do that in America when I was growing up. It's uh, it's moved in. Uh, nobody ever sous vide, you know, their their food. Nobody ever smoked it. Uh, these these are trends today that uh, that you find. Uh, they didn't used to do these kind of things. Uh, nobody ever served raw fish. You cook fish. Why would you put out a raw piece of fish? Jackie Mason said, sushi was invented by two Jews who said, how can we open a restaurant without a kitchen? <laughs> but I go, Let's, boards. Who came up with this idea of boards that now you have to have a board, you know? Uh, and and I know people at Mamish make their own boards. Now uh, what? And be able to set the stuff on. I don't know why. There are trends. Things become very trendy. So whether it's talking about styles or whether it's talking about uh, you know um, uh, you know fashion, food, 
um, music. Yeah. Um, the big band era in the 1940s, the swing, that type of music. And then the 50s, they started to introduce rock and roll. And then there was hard rock, answer, all kinds of different things. As Chotai Ani Azke Ayom, when I was in Los Angeles in 1977, I think it was, I, I was, I was out there by myself, you know, and uh, uh, I went out one night to a restaurant called the Milky Way, uh, which was in Westwood at the time. It was Steven Spielberg's mother who was running it. It was very trendy. Everything was, you know, California in the 70s. You know, everything was light. And, and it was just uh, very special. She had posters of her son's movies up. I remember she says, uh, do you know my son, Steven? I said, well, not personally, but I, I am familiar with his work. <laughs> so I was in Westwood. And I, I got this... Chuka, you know, this movie had come out that was supposed to be very funny called Airplane. And uh, I went to watch it at like a midnight showing in Westwood. You know? There was like eight of us in the theater. And we were laughing so hard. We were, we were falling out of our seats. It was just so incredibly funny. But there was one thing that brought the audience cheering. Now, there were only eight guys, so, you know. I think it was all guys now that I think about it <laughs> in this theater. And that is this plane is like, you know, this pilot who hasn't flown a, a real plane in, in, since World War II, you know, has to try to land this plane. And he's like, you're coming in too low, you know? So you see this antenna and it was like, WKRL, where disco lives. And he knocks down <laughs> the antenna and everybody starts cheering. <laughs> Because this was in the middle of the disco era, you know, uh, it was uh, it was an amazing time in in American life. It's it's now only like I say, uh, it's the, it's the stuff of jokes that people don't really go into. But every place was becoming a disco. Everybody was becoming you know these kind of things. You don't see it today. You know, it's uh, it was uh, at the time it was this. Uh, this phenomena, you know, and uh, I, I had started uh, working in NCSY in a chapter in LA in 1978, and there was a guy there who looked exactly like John Travolta, and he was upset at me because I wouldn't let him bring his non-Jewish girlfriend to the meetings. Anyway, uh, he wanted very much to have a disco night, and so I said, you know, listen, uh, uh, something like that requires a lot of planning and a lot of participation. If we make something like that, we don't get a good turnout, you know, it'll make us look embarrassing. Let's build up the group more first before we do that, you know. And it was amazing how much stuff I was able to get away with. You just say it with enough confidence. <laughs> there, there was a fellow who was on my, on my board over there in the chapter, Roger Braverman, and uh, he he was a cynic. My president, Joel Petler, they were they were cynics. That's why I was drawn. They they were drawn to me in that sense. Because, but when I wanted to do something, I had a way of selling it, presenting it, that people would you know do it. So it's towards the end of the year, and um, uh, and I was trying to get people to, you know, I was trying to present something like for them to make the decision. But you know, so Roger says you're doing it again. <laughs> So what he goes, you always do this. You know, you're like, well, you know, uh, which envelopes do you want to use? We can get these nice, beautiful, big envelopes that everybody will like, or these small, little, ugly ones. <laughs> he says, he says, I'm not falling for it this time. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I do have a, I, I, so I got out of it, you know, and uh, but. But he stayed after after the meeting ended, and he brought his non Jewish girlfriend in to show me their disco routine. And I, I guess I guess it was good. I, I, it's not really my area, you know. But um, um, he later on went on to become a rebbe in a yeshiva. So <laughs> I know most of my stories have no endings. Nevertheless, a happy one. So this is an unusual one. But uh, 
it, you know, it, it was the disco era and, and people don't know how it happened. <laughs> It ended up the whole thing happened as a lie. It was a guy who wrote an article for Rolling Stones and he made up his interviews that never happened and he created this whole disco life that wasn't really going on and then people fell for it and they started copying, you know? Life imitates art, as the expression goes. So, um, but that was it. Every place was coming at disco. When I was running NCSY in Long Island, we were going to do laser tag. I'm going to do it for an, an event, a laser tag. They had built this gigantic laser tag maze. And they spent millions of dollars on it. And six months later, it closed down. It, it came and went, you know. It was a, it was a, um, it was a fad. I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember Tamaguchis. We had them at the end of the 80s, early 90s. The little electronic pets that you had to take care of, or they died. I remember there was a story at the time in Japan that um, somebody uh, uh, forgot to feed their Tamaguchi and it died and they killed themselves. So uh, there are trends. There's trends in music. You know, there are certain musicians who were very popular and then they disappeared. They just, Mamish disappeared. And there are certain other ones, of course, who have staying power and some who are the flavor of the month and they come in and there's a style of music that comes in and, uh, you know, it, it, it um, captures the imagination. And then it goes, it's a fad. It's a fad. The reason I wanted to talk about this is because the same thing is true in Yadus. And it's absolutely amazing to me that there are things that at the time seemed like the most powerful thing you could possibly imagine. And it turns out it's a fad. And it might be a fad that lasts for hundreds of years. But it's a fad. Avodah was one of the reasons the first base of Migdash was destroyed. Avodah Zarah was such a powerful force. Now, to be fair, the Anjkin Esagodola came along and was Mavatal, the type of Avodah Zarah. And that's why uh, I think it was Menashe, but I'm not 100% sure. Comes to, I think it was Yaisi. I really should research. I'm sure I'm sure my, uh, my fact check is out there will send me in case I made a mistake. And uh, he was criticizing him for Vodazara, and he says, yeah, big shot, because the Anjali Kondola were Mavatal the Taiva. If you had been there, you would have lifted up your robe to run to go to serve a Vodazara. It was such a powerful desire. It was, it was uh, you know, drawing people. So... You don't find that a Vodazara after that time had the same appeal. Now, uh, you go to uh, these hotels that have gift shops and you see a little getch go over there. You almost never want to bow down. Those of you who went to camp uh, up at the Catskills or any place, you know, in the country, you come across a totem pole, you want to bow down, you know. It, there's, there's no type for it. It doesn't, it doesn't go. Misyavnim was this unbelievable, powerful movement in Klai Yisrael that apparently won over the majority of Jews. Greek culture. Do you find people today are drawn to Greek culture? Now, you could argue that what Greek culture introduced, which were universities and sports and the theater and things like that are still there in a different form, perhaps. But uh, there was a time when Greek philosophy was a major challenge to Torah Judaism, but a major one. People were being pulled into all of this desire of philosophy. Um, 
the it has continued for a very long time. You know, Greek uh, philosophy was kept alive in the Arab countries. And uh, it was such a powerful influence that one of the reasons the Rambam wrote the Mura Nevuchim was to counter Aristotle. Do you know anybody who cares about Aristotle today? That they have a kasha because of Aristotle. But at the time, it was unbelievable. The Tzadukim represented a particular philosophy that died out. It reappeared by the Kra'ayim, by the Karaites. Uh, it reappeared with the Reform Movement, uh, although in a different form. Uh, but, uh, but the idea of rejecting the Torah Shabal Peh uh, it really started probably with Korach. When uh, Korach says, eh, you're just making this up as you go along. And not that the Kodesh Baruch Hu said so. And uh, that was obviously a major threat to the Torah. Yeah? The Tzadukim came along and said, why do we have to listen to the rabbis? We don't have to listen to the rabbis. And they would come up with their own interpretations. And they took it very seriously. They, uh, the, they had an argument with the Chachamim on the meaning of the Pusik when you go into the Kodesh Gadoshim, whether or not you're supposed to light the incense there or beforehand. And they would go in knowing they were going to die, but they, wanted, they, were, they were willing to pay an enormous amount of money to become the coin Gadol just to be able to go in and do it their way, even though they ended up dying from it. But they kept the Torah she, she Bixav. They accepted the written Torah. Uh, the Karaites, the Kra'oyim, from the word Kra, like Mikra, like uh, Torah, um, was started by Anan ben David, as so often is the case. He uh, lost out the position of becoming, of becoming Rosh Hashiva. He decided to go into business for himself. And the way he did it by saying, who, why do we have to accept the Chacham's interpretation? And they would translate things literally. Um, this was such a major movement in Klai Yisrael that the Gaonim and the Rishonim had to write Perushim to defend the Torah Shev Shabal Peh against these attacks. This is how, this is how powerful it was. And you wonder to yourself, was Anand ben David bigger than everybody else who was around at the time? Uh, that's not necessarily how people make decisions. People don't make decisions just based on that. I mean, you don't know who Korach is. Korach was an unbelievably great person, right? Giant. But Moshe Rabbeinu, it's got the rays of light shining out of his face. I mean, you know who he is. He's got the stick. He took you out of Egypt. Korolono was a yum, Nosan was a mon. I mean, you, you know who Moshe is. And you're following Korach? Amazing. So the way that he did it, the Medjish Tanchuma says, was by light sunus. And you make fun of things, and uh, it all falls apart. Um, unfortunately, we see that today. That's, that's how these people on the internet attack Torah and Gedoli Torah is all with late sunnis. They sit and they machoizik and they make fun, knowing that once you've laughed at something, there's nothing you can, you know, you, you, can't, you can't look at it the same way anymore. Um, Yishayahu says, because you've made late sunnis out of the Musa I'm trying to give you, you have no option left now except suffering. Because when it gets painful enough, you can't laugh it off anymore. But you brought that on yourself. Because instead of, you know, listening to the words of Musa, I don't know if you've ever seen this, I've seen it, where someone gives really powerful Musa and people are really inspired, someone makes a joke and you could just watch it deflate. You watch it just dissipate, disappear in the room. 
That's the power of Leitzan is making fun. And that's what Karach did. He was making fun of Moshe Rabbeinu, making fun of the Torah. And these people, these people, you know, get on the internet. They've got their their sites and they do the same exact thing. They just machoizik, machoizik of Torah. They, you make fun and suddenly you have the ability to destroy anything with it. The maskilim did the same thing during the Enlightenment. When you use when you use late sunnis and you make fun, it's such a powerful tool that people don't look at it the same way anymore. Yeah. And that's where the only way to counter them is also with late sunnis, but you have to know how to do that in order to, you know, not end up uh getting sucked into it uh, yourself and uh without cheapening what's going on. But it's a a terrible thing. Yeah. So so this is what they do. You make fun. Uh, Shabtai Tzvi created a destruction in Klai Yisrael that is difficult for us to imagine today, a false messiah. And he fooled, he fooled Gedoli Torah. And people sold their belongings. They joined his army for their, his march to Eretzel. And the Turks captured him and threw him into prison and said, they're going to kill you unless he, you convert to Islam. And he converted. And Jews were devastated. They lost everything. Some people said, oh, this must be part of the process. They also converted. But there remains a little sect to this day of Sabbateans who are still following. There's also some Karaites left. I don't think there are any Sadducees. But, uh, you know, they become a footnote to history. But at one point, they had most of the Jewish people on their side. When the reform movement came in, it was an unbelievably powerful force. And they knew how to take over all of the public institutions to be able to destroy them. At the beginning, people didn't know what they were doing. It was a... Uh, uh, you know, it was a, a new kind of a phenomena that they started out by appearing to be from, and then they would take everything apart bit by bit by bit and destroy. They rejected the Torah Shabbat Sav also. You know, they didn't even believe the Torah Shabbat Sav. Remember hearing this debate uh, between a Reform and con Orthodox rabbi. The Reform rabbi said, God would never say the following. And I thought, wow, that's an amazing, amazing way. It means that you are smart enough to be God. And so you know whether or not, uh, you know, God is uh, uh, what he would say in this situation. That's just a, a bizarre concept when you think about it. But, you know, this is, uh, this is what... Um, uh, people were able to do. Of course, they 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 would make fun and they would use late sunnis and all the different kind of things to be able to undermine. You know, the big problem with reform is that reform is there to reform Judaism. But once you do, what are you left with? In other words, you know what they're not for, but what are they for? I was talking to... Uh, Reform rabbi, a rabbinical student, actually. And I said, why should I be a reformed Jew? He says, orthodox is misogynistic, they're racist. Da, da, da. I said, right. So you've explained to me why I shouldn't be an orthodox Jew. Why should I be a reformed Jew? Because the orthodox are that. I said, okay, convince me. I'm out. No more. Now, why should I be a reformed Jew? Very hard question to answer. Um, you know, humanistic approach and uh, fellow man. I said, so you're a secular humanist. I don't have to be a Jew to be that. I can, I can just choose to be a moral, nice person. And they get stuck at that point. Why should I be a reformed Jew? What's the point? Why keep it going? And that's why... Uh, they've slowly had to confront the fact that a lot of people ask the same question and, you know, watered down ritual that has no meaning by our own admittance it has no meaning. You know, how could you possibly celebrate Hanukkah when you're on the side of the Greeks? <laughs> 
Yeah. In other words, you know, the Greeks tried to bring to the Jewish pe people education, philosophy, literature, art, music, you know, sports, and we wanted to kill them. And you want to be on the side of the people who tried to kill the Greeks who are bringing us culture? On the Reform website, they uh, make it clear that the destruction of the temple was a good thing for the Jewish people. It freed them of this blood cult of killing animals in order to serve God. God doesn't want blood sacrifices. That's ridiculous. So the destruction of the temple is good. So what are you fighting over the Kotel for? You should be very happy. You, should, you shouldn't be fighting for access. You should be fighting to tear it down. It's the last remnant of a blood cult. That's a terrible thing. And so it's by definition doomed to failure. Now, when I was growing up, I would say the dominant... Uh, movement in, uh, in America was conservative Judaism because it was perfect for the 1950s and 60s until the youth rebellion when it was, you know, conservative. We make changes, but not too many changes. We still have uh, chazen, they were, at the time, they were still using let's say, an Orthodox prayer book. Um, the, in the Jewish Theological Seminary, um, they had a machitza up at their minion, you know, uh, when I was younger. Uh, they, they kept a lot of the trappings. They claimed to be part of the Orthodox tradition. But, you know, we make changes. And the changes were more like, you know, you can sit with your wife, you know, the f family that prays together stays together. Um, you know, uh, you could use a microphone because it's hard for people to hear. You can drive to shul. You know, like, you know, accommodations. And at the time, it was frighteningly popular. I remember reading a book that was written in the 70s called Four Paths to One God by a conservative uh, rabbi. And he presented four paths, Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, and Reconstructionist. And, um, and you know, he basically said Orthodoxy is, is a religion of old men who live on the Low East Side and, and in the Bronx. But everyone who moved out to the suburbs became conservative. And by the way, that's true. That's true. Um, my father grew up in an Orthodox home. And uh, uh, he was one of the founders of the East Meadow Jewish Center. And most of the people there came from Orthodox homes. The rabbi was Orthodox. The cantor was Orthodox. They used the Birnbaum sitter, which was an Orthodox sitter. They had mixed seating and a microphone. And, uh, and it was very interesting. The... Rabbi took a sabbatical for a year, and this other Orthodox rabbi came in just for the year, and he said, I'm not going to use the microphone. Make sure you turn off the microphone. <clears throat> he came in on the first Shabbos. The microphone was up. So what did he do? <laughs> he gets up to the pulpit. It's his notes, and it goes. And he walks away and stands on the steps leading up to the stage. And he says, and uh Nice, loud voice. This is my friends. This is my first Shabbos with you. I don't want to stand behind a pulpit. I want to be here with you. <laughs> it was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And uh, after, after he gave his sermon, which was very well received, he walks to the president and says, if that's on next week, I'm out. And he made all kinds of changes because that was a possibility. Rabbi Jeremiah Wahlberg should live and be well. He was the rabbi in O oh, Shalom and Merrick. And I don't think there were any from people in the shul. He created it out of whole cloth. It was interesting. Rabbi Riskin tried out for that shul. 
but uh, but they felt Rabbi Wolberg could also act as the chazan here, the beautiful voice, you know. And he would get up. <laughs> davening was called for nine o'clock. He was the only one in the shul. He'd get up to the to the bimba and he would start davening himself until people showed up. And he would give a forty-five minute drusha, and he was electrifying. And he pulled people in through the drusha. <laughs> that brought people to come, and people were like. You know, amazed, mesmerized by his messages, and he built a whole community of of Shama Shabbos people. It was it was absolutely amazing. So there were a lot of these people who still remember. They had the feel of of what it meant. I, of course, uh, went to this conservative synagogue. My father grew up in Brownsville. He remembered the great Chazanim. He remembered going down to the bakers where everybody had their cholent in his oven and they would bring it home, their cholent for, you know, for Shabbos. And that. I had none of these memories. I was a kid in Long Island. You know, we, we didn't keep Shabbos whenever anything. I went here. It was just the most boring, uh, empty, meaningless experience you could possibly imagine. And I wasn't the only one who felt that way. It was good if you remembered what orthodoxy was. So this was a, a drop down. It was a halfway house on your way out of Judaism. But at the time, it was unbelievably popular. So I asked one of the founders once, I said, you all came from orthodox homes. Why didn't you make an orthodox synagogue? So he said, we called down the orthodox. They had nothing to offer us. Well, we wanted to start a synagogue. They didn't know how to start a synagogue. The suburbanization of America that started in the 1950s, the, the Orthodox weren't prepared to capitalize on that. They didn't know how. They were in, uh, they were in established Jewish communities, but suddenly, you know, a, a bunch of Jews move out someplace and have to start a, a synagogue from scratch. They don't know what to do for them. So the reform came out. We invited out the reform, and he says... We grew up in Orthodox homes. It was too goyish for us. My father was not Shema Shabbos. He was outraged. He went to a bar mitzvah in uh, the Reformed Temple in Merrick, Beth Am. And he said, they wouldn't give you an aliyah if you were wearing a yarmulke. I don't know what their policy is today because my father was outraged. Because he used to say, you know, a reform a reformed Jew doesn't wear a yarmulke. An Orthodox Jew wears a yarmulke, and a conservative Jew carries it in his pocket. <laughs> but um, he says, we called down the conservative, and they said, we'll give you a constitution. We'll give you seed money to start your building fund. We'll give you a rabbi and pay his salary for, I don't know, three years. We'll give you a cantor. We'll give you a constitution. We'll, you'll right away join our... United Synagogue um, Synagogue Group. Your kids will start, you can start a youth organization, be part of USY, United Synagogue Youth. And, you know, and full, full, uh, you know, ready-made, you know, easy to assemble synagogue. And he says it was, it was perfect for us because we weren't Orthodox anymore, but we wanted to have the gefil. That's where I grew up. I had my bar mitzvah, in a conservative synagogue, 1973. In the 1970s, they did a study of a conservative synagogue, and they found that of 100 kids, three will become Orthodox, 17 will become Reform, 30 will remain conservative, 50 uh, of the 100 will disaffiliate completely and give up being Jewish. Which means they already knew in the 1970s they were going to be a third of their size. The 1980s, they did a population study, and they found that the age of the average conservative Jew was in their 50s. The age of the average Orthodox Jew was a teenager. And it was so interesting, because this book in the 70s said it was, you know, a religion of old men. But what happened? Uh, the day school movement came. Uh, the Gedolim at the time started the day school, put all of their effort into building the day school movement, and they changed. They changed the whole face of America. So conservative at one point was the rage. That disappeared. Shemesu Hirsch had to write extensively to 
deal with the, the philosophy of secular humanism. Nobody cares about secular humanism today. Uh, all the things that he wrote, all those efforts, it was a fad. And so when I was growing up, besides conservative Judaism, what was the fad? Science. Science is God. People worship science. I started teaching in Discovery in the early 90s. Uh, it was during my, uh, during my summer break. I taught during the year. Summer breaks, I would teach there in the summer. And uh, I had never seen Discovery before, and I was learning all the classes. And uh, they said, we used to have two one-and-a-half-hour classes in evolution. Yeah? To counter evolution and, and the arguments, etc. He says, we stopped them last year. And I said, why? He says... Because we spent the most of the first class teaching the theory of evolution to the university students. And the second class explaining why it doesn't make sense. So after a while, we realized these people don't know anything about evolution to start with. Nor do they care. People today don't really care about science. You know? Yes, there are those science wonks. There is a small you know, group. I remember when I was teaching Orla Golan rabbinical training. So one of the people there ended up working for a, an outreach organization in UCLA. And he said to me, you know, you said something during class, which I, I didn't believe. I said, it can't possibly be. He said, you have no idea how uneducated, uninformed, and apathetic the average university student is. They don't know anything. And I said, it can't be. And I come to UCLA. These people don't know anything. I'm talking about secular studies. They don't know anything. Remember, Mendel Weinbach, he says, uh, you know, I asked him a question once and he quoted Shakespeare. And he says, I can't say this over in yeshiva now. Nobody knows what it means. <laughs> or some, you know, pe people don't understand it. People don't know anything. The, you know... I was talking to a group of students. I said, we go to university. What do we mostly do? They gave two answers. Party, drink. So, okay. I was speaking to a group of secular parents. I said, we send, spend all this money. We send their kids to college. What do they mostly do? Same answer. Party, drink. I was speaking to a group of Orthodox parents. I said, we send our kids to university. And what do they do? Study. I said, you must think this is the University of Vienna in 1898. And everyone's got little bow ties and the little wire rim glasses and their briefcases and then their search for knowledge. I said, you ask your kids and they'll tell you. You find out which professor is the easy A and that's the one that you take. You don't want to challenge yourself. I don't want to work hard. You know? I always get a kick out of these people who say, why are you wasting your time in yeshiva? You know, why don't you go to college? I said, yeah, but you have to do two mornings and two afternoons a week. That's called a full program. Two mornings and two afternoons. When yeshiva, the say, first say that goes from nine o'clock in the morning to one o'clock in the afternoon. Second say that goes from three o'clock in the afternoon to seven o'clock at night. And the third say that goes from uh, like eight till 10 or 1030. Yeah, we decided to take the easy way out. Just fool around. You know, it's amazing. It's amazing. And within those two mornings and two afternoons, you find out which are the easy classes and which are the easy professors and who's going to pass you. I remember when I was teaching in Or Semitic, when I first started, I was in the intro program. And I, all these guys went to like top universities. And I was explaining a pretty easy Gemara and, and they were like having a very hard time. One guy is holding his head. He says, my brain hurts. I said, well, don't you guys, you know, have to study hard in university? And they're like, no. You have to study hard to get into university. And then if they don't pass you, it makes them look bad. So there's trends. Real Torah stands forever. There's no such a, no such a thing. It's not a fad. It's not a trend. And even though things will at some point look like, wow, you know, Torah Judaism is finished. 
And by wine tells the story where he went into a Judaic shop. He wanted to buy a kitsais. The guy laughed at him. He says, there'll never be a kitsais printed in America. He says, when the first one came out, I sent him a copy. <laughs> uh, when the first kitsais came out, I sent him a copy. <laughs> you know, people, people think that the latest trend and whatever is going on, this is where it's going to go. And it's not true. It's interesting. In Jewish music, there's a move away from the techno nonsense and more towards like, you know, what they call either like the Karlbach music or the Hasidic music. And people are moving away from what was that boy band of the 80s and 90s type of a music and moving back more towards traditional music. That's how life works. That's how life works. So uh, beware of trends, yeah? Um, something may seem very popular, but give it enough time and you'll see fads fall away and only things that are real stay on and continue. Mir Hashem, all of us should be able to have a Torah true life and incorporate that for ourselves and our family. And now we come to the question and answer portion of our program. Anonymous asks, Hi, just wondering why you never have any girls or women on your show. Is it for Tzniah's reasons or were there just no one willing to come? <laughs> this is a great question. A great question. This is a concept you find in Israeli society called Hadarat Nashim how women are excluded from, uh, from, public, uh, from public forums. Um, uh, the, um, um, uh, this is an issue in America, it comes up every now and then, where there are certain Torah periodicals that will not print pictures of women in there. Uh, there was the famous uh, scandal when the Hamodia put in the picture of everybody waiting for the um, report of the raid on Osama bin Laden, and they airbrushed Hillary Clinton out of the picture. Yeah. And people was, oh, Hadarat Nashim, and you're excluding women, et cetera, et cetera. And people will point out the Jewish Observer printed pictures of women. And that was, you know, definitely a. Mm, an orthodox Torah true publication, yeah? And uh, the question is why? So I'm going to give you a couple of answers because so I think there's a few different answers to this. There used to be a site called Only Simchas. I don't know if it's still around. Uh, I think it's still around, but they limit the amount of pictures, etc. Because I know Yeshiva Bachman used to go on and look at the pictures of the girls. <laughs> that's, that's what they did. Uh, a average, healthy, red-blooded uh, male, given the choice between looking at anything else, will look at a girl. <laughs> I remember when I was speaking in the Vey Rishalayim, this girl said, you know, I went out with a boy. And uh, he didn't want to go to a cafe, he says, because they had uh, waitresses. And he didn't want to see the waitresses. I said, okay, he's obviously a boy of fine moral standing. And, uh, you know, that's what you're looking for in a husband, someone who's not going to be looking at other women. And she says, well, he doesn't have to look at the women. There's so many other things to look at, you know, the trees and the flowers. Anyway, I burst out laughing. It took me a full minute to compose myself. I was laughing so hard. And she said, oh no, I'm going to be one of your stories. And I said, yes, you will. <laughs> I said, do you really think when you're standing under the chuppah, your husband's going to be staring at your bouquet? <laughs> Given a choice between looking at trees and flowers, a guy is going to look at a girl. And those publications, which do print pictures of girls and women, I know for a fact that boys and men look at the pictures of the girls and the women, not out of 
a healthy sense of, oh, who's being on it over there? But checking them out. I was uh, on a plane once waiting for the bathroom, and I see somebody on their phone, and they have pictures from uh, Hasana. And when they would come to a picture of a woman, they would enlarge it. Not the entire picture. <laughs> Only parts of the image. <laughs> my mouth dropped open. I was like, gosh, these, these poor people get dressed up, go to a chazana. They have no idea that they're being used for immoral purposes. <laughs> so the, the places where they um, don't want to put up pictures of women, etc., that's the that's the reason. Now, those of you who have been watching the Rabbi Olavsky show know that I'm a very questionable moral character. <laughs> I'm just a poor dumb balchuva, and I went to a co-ed high school, and uh, you know I have eight daughters. You know what I mean? So I have a, a more liberal approach, perhaps, than other people, um, but. I am keenly aware of my audience. And I remember when I was working for NCSY and they were having all the youth organizations coming together in an event, and I insisted that the food be glad kosher. And they said, you know, why are you making demands on everybody else? Why does everybody else have to meet your standards? And I said, because everybody can eat glot kosher. It doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it's not against anybody's religion to eat glot kosher. But if you buy the stuff, buy platters from Ben's uh, Deli, which is Hebrew National and open on Shabbos, I can't eat it. So if you want to do that, you can do that. But understand, I will not participate. Because... If you set a standard that everyone can participate in, okay. Now, having said that, when you watch my show, you know that you're, it's a little bit of a roller coaster ride. And when I speak in a regular yeshiva or a regular base Yaakov, I eschew all of my secular references, even though you know they're a part of who I am and my background. I leave them out. I don't make any television or movie or, you know, uh, uh, you know, s societal, you know, stuff. I, I don't need it. Yeah. Even though it's part of who I am, but on the podcast, I will allow myself that liberty. Although there are people who are uncomfortable with it and I understand that, you know, and, and those people, um, really should be watching one of the other hundreds of presenters on Torani Time or other places where you get your shiurim instead of me. Because, you know, what can I tell you? I bring, I bring a certain flavor to it. I agree. Having said that, um, I have met maybe a half a dozen people who tell me they really enjoy the podcast. I said, really? He goes, yeah, I, I call up and listen. Because Torah Anytime has an option that you don't need the internet. You can just call on the phone and listen to the shiurim. That means that I have listeners out there who have such sensitivity, they don't use the internet. Uh, while you're listening to me, I'm not sure. <laughs> By the way, we've just gone on to 24-6 which is a, an, a forum which only carries um, kosher programming, and uh, we're there now. Um, for, uh, for a while, we were on Nucky Radio, and then they took us off because I'm not so Nucky. And now someone told me we came back on, but we're in the adult section, you know. Warning, this podcast will maintain material that will be offensive to some viewers. <laughs> Please ask your children to leave the room. I can understand that. I have no objection to that. So therefore, I know that there are people who will be uncomfortable if I have women on the show. Now, 
I'm going to, I'm going to tell you something I've tried to do for five years and I can't get my kids to do it. Um, I have an extremely talented group of children. Yeah. Um, they've all taken ballet. They all, many of them have taken modern dance. Many of them have taken singing lessons. Uh, many of them have, uh, are, have taken art, chugim, you know, and, uh, and are, are artistic. Many of them speak and teach. Uh, I have a, a very um, uh, talented group of kids. So I wanted to do a Purim episode on the concept of Hadarat Nashim, of women being excluded. And I wanted three of my girls to come on and wear sheets over there. <laughs> As I hit the and say, so uh, what's your opinion of women being excluded <laughs> And to me, this is one of the funniest things. Again, I just do a very straight interview. <laughs> uh, every now and then, my kids are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at the last minute, they always back out on me. <laughs> but that has been one of my chukas I've wanted to do for the longest time. I think that would be so incredibly funny. But there are definitely uh, women that I would love to be able to have on the podcast. And um, the only reason I'm not is... For people who uh, it would make them uncomfortable, and I really try as much as possible to stay within a certain range when I do the podcast that I can be shovel a call as much as possible. So hopefully, I know I have non-Jews who listen to the show. I know I have secular people who listen to the show. I know I have people from all walks of life, including I have a large following in uh in the Hasidic community um i had uh there is a above yeshiva in bat yam a couple of three guys came for a shabbos suda and uh clearly yiddish was their first language i have israelis who tell me how, they write to me in hebrew how much they enjoy the podcast and i was like you understand english he goes enough to follow your your podcast but it's it was very interesting because it's a very, I, I try to be as positive as, as I can and to give a positive message. You know, uh, it was interesting, you know, they used to do these two giant uh, evenings for Shemir Saloshan, one in Hebrew and one in English. Thousands of women would come. And uh, I would, I would uh, often emcee the English one. And... Uh, and these Israeli girls would come over to me at the end and say, Kavod, whatever. I said, why don't you go to the Hebrew one? He goes, it's so negative. It's so heavy. It's so negative. When you come to the English one, it's so positive. It's so uplifting. It's, it makes you feel good, you know? So, uh, so that's why I'm, you know, not because there aren't people that I would like to interview, uh, only because I'm trying to... Uh, trying to satisfy the wide ranging crowd that I have. And that's, uh, that's the answer. Okay. That's it for this episode. If you want to find out more about the show, you can go to my website, rabbiolaski.com. You can make a comment. You can write an email. Um, you could sponsor an episode. You could sponsor a question and answer. You could sponsor a partial in five. You could, uh, uh, download other material and other shiurim. You could sign up for one of our online shiurim, Masil um, Shasharim, uh, Tefillah, or the Daf Yomi. Uh, I had mentioned a time ago about uh, maybe starting another online shir, and someone suggested maybe to do Pirkei Avos. I happen to, I happen to find that intriguing because I have my own little shul, and uh, and during the summer I do a you know, Pirkei Avos, and I do it by Ian, you know. So we started uh, the Shabbos after Pesach, and we're in the second Mishnah. So we started Perik Bays this year. We did Perik Aleph last year, and, and Perik Bays. You know, I, and I'm, I'm finding I have a lot to say. 
So that might be a really interesting thing to start. So if there are people interested in that, please let me know. Uh, you can go to the uh, website. You can, uh, you can uh, you know, email over there and say, yeah, I would be interested in signing up for something like that. We'd have to try to find a time and that will work for most people. And uh, see you from there. Anyway, that's it for this episode. Until next time, I am David Orlovsky, and this has been The Rabbi Orlovsky Show. It's The Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Torah and Simcha, ready to go. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Knowledge and wisdom will help you grow. Lots of fun in every episode, and we don't have to rhyme. No, we don't. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show on RabbiOrlovsky.com. Torah, anytime, YouTube, and more. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Torah and Simba, ready to go. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Till next time, till we meet again. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Show.